will rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you tonight. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for the great sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ coming from heaven, coming down to us. We thank you, Lord, of the spotless, holy life that you lived. And we thank you, Lord, because of the great sacrifice that you went to the cross of Calvary and he died for us so that he can bring us, bring us into the kingdom, bring us into the life of the real child of God and eventually bring us to glory. We're thanking you, Lord, tonight because the gospel has worked in our lives. And Lord, we pray as we have committed the proclamation of the gospel unto every one of us, will not be ashamed in Jesus' name. And we're praying the strength and the power, the conviction and the courage to take this gospel and take it everywhere you send us. You give us that courage, give us that conviction in Jesus' name. We're praying, Lord, for the old church, that every member of the church will do their part so that ministers, members, preachers, and the people who are in the church will take the whole gospel and take it to our world in Jesus' name. We're asking tonight that you speak your word to every heart and you lead us in the right direction. Every shame, every cowardice, you'll take away from everyone in Jesus' name. The courage to stand and speak. The courage to go forth and proclaim the gospel. And the courage to be faithful to you and to the proclamation of the gospel all the days of our lives grant to everyone in jesus name we well, thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray god bless you you can sit down as you know already we are at the congress and for our brothers and sisters, invitees who are the Bible study in the church, in your local church, we're transmitting directly to you from the Congress. This happens to be the first message of the Congress. And it's also the study, uh, the Bible study uh, subject uh, tonight. In the Congress, we're dealing with the Epistle to the Romans from chapter 1 to chapter 16. And tonight we come to the introductory message, which is Romans chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 1. Look at it from verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which, talking about that gospel now, which he had promised for that is before this time by his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son jesus christ our lord which was made of the seed of david according to the flesh and it, it was declared to be the son of god with power according to the spirit of holiness the holy spirit by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome. Beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we go on to verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For herein, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written. The just shall live by faith. As we come to this epistle, we want to understand and remember 
that is an epistle inspired of God, written by Paul the Apostle. And it was sent to all that be in Rome. And then it's sent to us and sent to all that call on the name of the Lord. And that will still call on the name of the Lord. Everything that is written here belongs to the church. And belongs even to the world in the sense that it's written for their salvation. And it's written for the justification of sinners. And it's written for us to benefit. It's written for us to take note of, believe, accept, acknowledge, and live by. We're told in Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. And whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning. And as we look at the epistle to the Romans, Reaching a full time, reaching before this time, and here we are today, reading, learning, and studying. All this is reaching a full time, we're reaching for our learning. And we, that we, through the, the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And so it is given to us, number one, to save and to sanctify. It is given to us to teach us and to train us in the way of the gospel. It is reaching to us to prepare us and equip us as preachers and proclaimers of Christ's saving gospel. Tonight we're looking at verses 1 through to 17. And I divide the study and the message to three parts. Number one, Paul, the preacher of the gospel of God. Paul, the proclaimer of the gospel of God. Paul, the publisher of the gospel of God. And then point number two, his plan of proclaiming the gospel of grace. He had a plan, he had a purpose, he had a goal, he had a calling. And the calling was to publicize and to proclaim, to declare the gospel of the grace of God. Point number three, the passion for preaching the gospel of godliness. The passion for preaching the gospel of godliness will come to point number one. Paul, the preacher of the gospel of God. You come to Romans chapter 1 verse 1. And the very first word you meet there, Paul. Who was Paul? What happened to him? How did he live his life? What legacy has he left for you and for me? What example has he led for you as a child of God? What example, what model has he led for you as a preacher of the gospel? Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, a born slave of Jesus Christ, bought, purchased, redeemed by the blood of Christ. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, sold out to him, given to him, committed to the Lord without belonging, any idea of belonging to himself anymore. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, not a servant of men, not a servant of the Sanhedrin, not a servant of a religious group. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, a person who understood that because I am bought, because I'm purchased, I do not belong to myself. And the will I come to do now on earth is the will of the Messiah, the will of the Master, and the will of the one who has called me, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. It says, now I understand, I'm completely separated, detached from the world, attached to the Lord, separated from the world and from sin, and from his own past life, is totally committed now unto the Lord. Paul, as we look at this Paul, number one, he was convicted. Number two, he was converted. 
Number three, he was called and commissioned. Number four, he was consecrated unto just this one thing. Number five, he was a conquered captive. The Lord had conquered him, conquered his will, and now he saw himself as a captive of the Lord, totally conquered. Number six, a crucified man, a crucified minister. Number seven, a cross bearing preacher. There were, there were blows upon blows to buffet him. But then he said, I rejoice now. In all the tribulation, all the persecution, Paul, a compelled, constrict person, he was constrict into the army of the Lord. And he said, I don't have any choice about that. Necessity is laid upon me. Ten, he was a contesting, contending minister. He fought with those enemies in Ephesus. And he never gave up. He kept on preaching the word. 11. He was a courageous minister. Courageous. You see that all over as he went preaching the gospel. Number 12. He was constantly concentrated. He concentrated on just this one thing. He grieved that. He grabbed that. He will not let go because of this one single calling. Look at this. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 3. He had been walking against the Lord and fighting against the gospel. And against the doctrine of salvation through Christ and through faith in Christ alone. Until he became number one. Convicted. Acts chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city. And it shall be told thee what thou must do. He was convicted. Convicted of his rebellion. Convicted of his sin. Convicted of his opposition. Convicted of his fighting heaven and fighting the Lord. And then he said, I surrender. I give up. What will you have me to do? Convicted. Number two, converted. You come to that same chapter. And we're looking at verse 17. He was converted. Why are we emphasizing this? You cannot be called into the ministry. Except you're convicted of your sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you're convicted to the point you want to get out of that sin. You want to get away from that sin. You want to live a new life. What will you have me to do? It happened to him. It must happen to everyone that proclaims the name of the Lord. Verse 17, and Ananas went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, as sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He was converted. And the conversion showed very clearly. It affected his life. It showed in his life. And then he was called and commissioned. In Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Reading from verse 15. 
It tells us in verse 15 about his experience. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal a son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not of flesh and blood. He immediately took up the challenge. He received the call and he obeyed the commission. Look at verse 22. And was unknown by faith unto the churches of Judea, which were in, in Christ, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed and the glorified God in me convicted converted called and commissioned and then he was consecrated to God how many people have been called by the Lord but they fail in that calling because of the lack of consecration but in the case of Paul the Apostle, he followed up, he followed through with consecration. He tells us in Philippians chapter 3, reading from verse 7, Philippians chapter 3 verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted laws for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. He said, It's not just a past consecration, not that only that I counted everything lost for Christ. I still do that today. He says, I do count them even today lost for Christ. It was a conquered captive conquered captive the lord conquered him and he never tried to manifest his own will galatians chapter 1 verse 10 for do i now persuade men or god or do i seek to please men for if i yet please men i should not be the servant of christ he conquered captive and you know, he was crucified. Self-will crucified. And personal ambition crucified. Having his own way crucified. It tells us in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. It says, I, Paul the Apostle, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It says the life he now lived, he wasn't living by this is what I want and this is what I'm going to do. It says, but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And he brought his cross. He had a cross to bear. And he bore that cross. He bore the cross cheerfully. He bore the cross joyfully. He bore the cross without murmuring or complaining. He bore the cross. And he still went on in the work he was called to do. In 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 12, in verse 7, and it says, Unless I shall be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was a giving unto me a son in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. He had his challenges, he had the cross, he had the trials, he had the persecutions, he had the buffeting of the enemy of Satan. He says, For this sin I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now he tells us most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I glory in that. I rejoice in that. He bore all those things cheerfully. 
And then he was compelled. He was constricted into the army, into the army of the Lord. And he said that to himself. He said, I don't have any choice about this. He conquered me. He conquered my will. And I'm constricted into his army. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Reading from verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Reading from verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me unto me. If I preach not the gospel. It says I don't have any freedom to say I will, I will not. I might, I might not. I may go back to the field. I may not go back to the field. He said, what choice do I have? I'm constricted into his army. And I'm compelled by the Lord himself. And he says in verse 17, For if I do this sin willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, he was constrained and he was consumed by the zeal to do what the Lord had called him to do, compelled as well as consumed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, they were all dead. He said, I look at Calvary. I'm compelled to publicize what Calvary has provided for the world. I look at Christ on the cross and I'm constrained to do what he has done. He gave his life for the whole of humanity. I must give everything of God for the salvation of my world. And he tells us in verse 15 and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. He's saying that's not just for him. It's for every one of us. And when he did what he did, he did that courageously. He was courageous. You remember, he was in the prison of Silas. And then in the midnight, instead of pitching themselves, and instead of uh, saying, why did this happen to us? They said, if we cannot preach, we can sing. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas preached and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaking. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands loosed. And he didn't see Silas of jumping out, running out, running away. That's a courageous man. He had suffered quite a lot. And yet in the midst of that suffering, the Lord opened the door of the prison. And the Lord opened the windows. And all the prison people, did all their bands were loose. And yet they remained there. The following day, look at verse 35. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant saying, let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this, saying to Paul, the magistrate have said to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. You think the man will run out and say, praise the Lord. He has answered that prayer, persecution is over. And then he have told us to go now. Look at his response. But Paul said unto them, they are beating us openly, uncondemned, being Romans. And have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privately, privately? Nay, verily. But let them come themselves and fetch us out. That's a courageous man. And I pray that in this new year, the Lord will give us that same courage in Jesus' name. He can and he will. I said he can and he will. It will make you courageous to do everything he has appointed for you to do in Jesus' name. He was a constantly concentrated man. A man with focus. A minister with focus. That he said, 
this one thing I do. It wasn't a man, a minister that will be here and there achieving nothing. Philippians chapter 3. Reading from verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. In this new year, if you can map out that one thing, identify that one thing, concentrate on that one thing and do it and do it and do it again. Whatever comes and whatever goes, whoever helps, whoever hinders, one thing I do. He had challenges, but then he said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He kept on pressing, he pressing spirit, he pursuing spirit, a purposeful spirit. The Lord give that to every one of us in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 20 verse 24. In Acts chapter 20 verse 24, it tells us chapter 20 of Acts and in verse 24, it tells us in that verse 24, but none of these things move me. Challenges, imprisonment, persecution, opposition, pressure, false brethren, whatever, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. I pray that will be in your heart. I pray that will be in your life. That everybody that sees you will know that you have a goal, you have a destiny, you have a destination, and you have something you are aiming at, and you purpose it in your heart, and you say, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course of joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. God. That was the ad. That's what we have. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. Let's come back to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, we're looking at it from verse 1. It tells us, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, that's a real servant. That's a true servant. That's a committed servant. That's a courageous servant. That's a servant that puts his neck to the yoke and then will not avoid that yoke whatever the difficulty and he says now i'm separated unto the gospel of god which he had promised afore by his age by his uh, prophet in the holy scriptures he tells us now he says is the gospel of god and he had promised that gospel What's the purpose of that gospel? What's the power of that gospel? And what is the uh, inheritance of the gospel that we have got? Look at verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Everyone will have to say that by himself. Everyone will have to give himself to that, addict himself to that, and say, There is one inheritance of God. There is one commodity I've got. There is something that is beneficial to the whole universe that I've got. And it is the gospel of Christ. And I'm not ashamed. For it is the power of God. Unto salvation to everyone. Everyone that believes. To the Jew first. And also to the Greek. To the Gentiles. In Romans chapter 10. Reading from verse 15, it tells us the characteristic of this gospel. Romans chapter 10, verse 15, it says in 10, 15, And how shall they preach, except they be saved? Thank God we are saved. I said, thank God we are saved. As it is written, how beautiful, at the feet of them, that preach the gospel of peace. 
If the gospel of God is the gospel of peace, the gospel that reconciles us to God. And now we can have peace with God and bring glad tidings of good things. It tells us in chapter 15 of Romans. Romans chapter 15 verse 29. Romans chapter 15 verse 29. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Is the gospel of God? Is the gospel of Christ? Is the gospel of peace? Is the gospel of grace? And it has all the blessings that everyone in the whole world needs from reconciliation to remission of sin to redemption and into the righteousness of God and into the final glory and so he talks about the gospel and what are the details of that gospel that he made sure that he always mentioned to the people that listen to him and we must always mention if we're going to preach the real gospel uh, first corinthians chapter 15 First Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Here is the gospel, the gospel of God. Here is the gospel, the gospel of Christ. Here is the gospel, the gospel of grace. Here is the gospel, the gospel of peace. The gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and when ye stand, and by which also ye are saved. Is the gospel of salvation. It brings salvation. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I declared unto you, here is the gospel now, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That must be in the presentation of the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures the gospel is according to the scriptures anything contrary to the scriptures is not part of the gospel verse 4 and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and he did that for our justification let's come back to romans chapter 1 in Romans chapter 1, looking at verses 3 and 4. Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, concerning his son. What does that mean? The gospel concerns his son. His birth, his life, his death, his sacrifice, his atonement, his redemption, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, his intercession for us now. Concerning his son. What does that mean? Concerning his son who became the sacrifice. The son who became our substitute. The son who became our savior. The son who became our sin bearer. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. What does that mean? Concerning his son, our savior. The only savior. Concerning his son, our redeemer, the only redeemer. Concerning his son, our sanctifier, the only sanctifier. Concerning his son, the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Concerning his son, a captain, the captain of our salvation, who is bringing us to glory. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David. He came humanly through the lineage of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power, according to the spirit of holiness, there and the, by the resurrection from the dead. He's been sent to us. And because he's sent to us, he's not telling us what to do. And what are you going to do? And what have you done? Of that Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, we're reading from verse 26. Acts chapter 3, verse 26, concerning his Son. Unto you, false God, having raised up his Son Jesus, sent him to bless you. In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's what he came to do. He came to save us. 
He came to turn us away from our iniquity and thereby give us salvation. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We come back to this uh, Romans chapter 1. And I'm reading now from verse 5. Romans chapter 1 verse 5. By whom that is this Jesus who died for us. By whom this Jesus was buried. This Jesus who rose again. This Jesus who is bringing us to repentance and remission of sin and righteousness. By whom we have, we have received grace and apostleship. For the obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. He tells us through this Jesus we have grace, grace and salvation. We have grace, grace and holiness. We have grace, grace and sanctification. We have grace, grace and peace of mind. We have grace, grace and purity of heart. We have grace, grace and service. We have grace, grace and calling. Grace and commission. Grace and ministry. Grace and apostleship. Everything we get from the Lord is on the basis of, of grace. We have that grace force that brings us to salvation and eventually brings us to the service of the Lord. In Titus chapter 1, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2. Reading from verse 11, it tells us about the grace that comes into our lives, coming from the Lord Jesus Christ and bringing every other thing we need for our personal spiritual lives and for the ministry, for the grace of God that brings salvation as appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. That's what Jesus has done in giving us salvation, in giving us sanctification, in bringing us into his service, the service of the kingdom. He had to do this he gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And I pray that all the grace you need, all the grace we need, the Lord will give to every one of us without any restriction or restraint in Jesus' name. I thought you'll say good, good, amen. amen. we we'll come to point number two now. His plan of proclaiming the gospel of grace. Paul had a plan. You must also have a plan. It tells us about the plan. And you ought to be thinking during this uh, Congress, uh, you need to put it down. Here is uh, January. And until the end of the year, what's my plan? What's my goal? Where am I going to reach? Where will I take the gospel to? And there are towns I must reach, write that down. And there are local governments I must reach, write that down. And there are states you must reach, write that down. And then you make a plan. Because he made a plan, it's not enough to say, I will, I will do it. I will come there, I will go there, I will come to them, I will get to them. There must be a plan. His plan of proclaiming the gospel of grace. We're looking at it from verse 6. Among whom are ye also the cult of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, cult to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, every day, every time, I make mention of you, always in my prayers, making requests, if by any means, now at least, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. He said, I have a plan. 
and I've been planning and praying about this that I will come to you for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith of you of both both of you and me now I would not have you ignorant brethren that I often times purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, was hindered hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. As you look at the uh, plan that he had, you see three things. Number one, he prayed. Number two, he planned. Number three, he purposed. Number one, he prayed. And he told them exactly that in verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. If you have a plan, you must pray through that plan. You must pray for the people you are going to reach. And you must take them to the Lord in prayer every time he prayed for them without ceasing. Number two, he planned. It's not enough to just pray. You must follow up your prayer with planning. You want to go and evangelize? Pray, then plan. And you want to go to that house, go to that community, pray, then plan. You want to reach that local government, that community, pray, then plan. He, he planned to come and impart some gifts unto them. Look at verse 10. Making requests by any means. Now at least I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you. That I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end. You may be established. He prayed, he planned, he purposed. He purposed. Look at verse 13 there. He said, now I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that of times I purposed. I purposed. You must have a firm purpose. And you must keep on looking at that every day. I plan to go there. I'm praying to go there. I purpose to go there. If you have a purpose, every hindrance will brush out of the way. Everything that will stand in the way, you'll clear up. Or it may be in your personal life, anything that looks like you don't have a firm purpose, all that you take away. That I purpose to come unto you. That I might have some fruit among you, even as among other Gentiles. As you look at uh, that uh, part, the plan of proclaiming the gospel of grace. He assured them of three things. Number one, called to be saints. Called to be saints. Number two, converted to the faith beyond their immediate society Com converted to the faith beyond their immediate society number three commitment to their growth and steadfastness number one called to be saints as he talked as he wrote to the romans the believers he told them i have been called i know my calling my calling to salvation my calling to sanctification my calling to service. And then he said, I want to remind you too, you believers in Rome, that you are called and you are called to be saints. Look at verse 7. To all that be at in Rome, called of God, beloved of God, called to be saints. Called to be saints. We need to remember that every time. That the converts were bringing to the kingdom of God, they're not just coming into the church. They are called to be saints, and their lives must reflect that saintliness, that sanctification, that holiness. If that is their calling, our preaching must reflect, reflect that. If that is their calling, our follow-up must reflect that. If that is their, their calling, our counseling must reflect that. Called to be saints, First Thessalonians chapter 4, reading here from verse 7. It says, for God has not called us unto uncleanness, 
but unto holiness Paul the apostle assured them even in the first chapter before going too far that they were called to be saints called to be holy we're told in first peter chapter one first peter chapter one reading from verse 15 and verse 16 it tells us about her calling it says but i see which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for i am holy but not only that he told them that their conversion to the faith was not just to be limited to the community limited to the locality limited to their country it must go beyond their immediate society we're coming to romans chapter 1 verse 8 romans chapter 1 verse 8 for i thank my god through jesus christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world their conversion went beyond their community their conversion resulted in a new conduct a new character it, uh, it resulted in a new comportment and everybody was talking about that they saw the change of life that they had because if any man be in christ it's a new creature all things are passed away and all things have become new and that is what other people also heard about in uh, romans chapter 16 verse 19 romans chapter 16 verse 19 for your obedience is come abroad unto all men your obedience your response to the faith your righteousness your pure life your change of life the transformation it has come abroad that's the beauty of preaching the gospel that's the beauty of receiving the gospel our converts if their lives change and when those lives change and their communities can see that they'll be able to say we know something has happened to you definitely for your obedience has come abroad unto all men i am glad therefore on your behalf but yet i would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil and then he the apostle himself was committed to their growth and steadfastness committed to their growth and steadfastness that's why i told them in chapter 1 verse 9 chapter 1 verse 9 he said was praying for them what was he praying for their growth and steadfastness for god is my witness whom i serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing i make mention of you always in my prayers then he tells us in verse 11 for i long to see you that i may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end for the purpose that ye may be established he wanted them established he wanted them to grow and he wanted them to be steadfast we'll come to point number three the passion of, for preaching the gospel of godliness the passion for preaching the gospel of godliness we're reading now from verse 14 all through to verse 17 verse 14 for i am debtor both to the greeks and to the barbarians both to the wise and to the unwise so as much as in me is i am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at rome also understand they had received the gospel and they had been saved and their faith and obedience even went abroad to many places beyond their immediate society and yet he said there's still much more you're saved there's much more you're sanctified there's much more you're obedient to the lord there's much more that's why he says i count myself a debtor and i must still come to you because it says in verse 15 so as much as me in me is i am ready to preach the gospel to you that are true also why for i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of god unto salvation 
to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Notice here, number one, he had a debt he owed. A debt he owed. Number two, the decision he offered. He offered a decision to them. He says, I'm deciding this. I've been praying about it. And I'm ready now to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Number three, the duty he owned. The duty he owned. He had ownership of the duty. He didn't transfer that to Silas or transfer that to Timothy. This is the duty and it is mine. And then, uh, number four, the doctrine he obeyed. The doctrine he obeyed. Verse 14. That's the debt he owed. I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Number two, the decision he offered. Verse 15. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Number three, the duty he owned, for I am not ashamed, verse 16, of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. Number four, the doctrine he obeyed. For here in Darien is the righteousness of God revealed from face to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Look at that all over again. Number one, the debt that must be paid. The debt that must be paid. You must realize that you owe debt to your father, your mother. You know the gospel, you have the gospel, they don't have the gospel. And to your children, you have the gospel, they don't have the gospel. And to your neighbors, you have the gospel, they don't have the gospel. And therefore, there's a debt that must be paid. Look at verse 14. I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. And he says to the wise and also to the unwise. He wasn't saying that section, Timothy, you take that. That other section, Titus, you take that. And that other section, Silas, you take that. He said, I'm debtor to everyone, to the literate and to the illiterate, to the high and to the low, to the men and to the women, to the people that are knowledgeable and to the people that know nothing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. A debt I must pay. Necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this sin willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. <clears throat> Number two now. The decision which must be pursued. Number one, the debt that must be paid. Number two, the decision that must be pursued. The people that take a decision, don't pursue that decision. They don't work on that decision. They don't follow up on that decision. They don't follow through on that decision. But the Paul the Apostle said, I've taken a decision, but I'm going to follow through. I'm going to pursue it. The decision which must be pursued. We're looking in at chapter 1 of Romans, verse 15. So, as much as in me is, what does, it, what does that mean? As long as God gives me strength. What does that mean? As long as I have breath in this body. What does that mean? As long as he has still giving me the opportunity of a voice coming out. He says, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Acts chapter 21. 
In Acts chapter 21, here we're reading from verse 13. Then Paul answered, What mean ye? To weep and to break mine heart, for I am ready, not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. You can see that he was willing to pursue it to the point of death. If you count the preaching of the gospel important, how much are you willing to pursue that decision that you will preach that gospel? Number three, the dedication which must be preserved. The dedication which must be preserved. We're looking at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's a kind of dedication the church must still preserve. Every minister must still preserve. Every member of the church must still preserve. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew force, and also to the Greek. We're looking at chapter 15 of Romans. Romans chapter 15. And here we're reading from verse 19. Romans chapter 15. Reading from verse 19. In verse 19 it tells us, Through mighty signs and wonders, By the power of the Spirit of God, So that from Jerusalem and round about Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. It's a dedication that must be preserved. And then number four now, the doctrine which must be published. The doctrine which must be published. We're looking at Romans chapter 1 verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's what brought the reformation. That's what brought the religious people of Luther's days out of darkness, out of the darkness of religion. The just shall live by faith. Galatians chapter 3 from verse 11. Galatians 3 verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. We keep on publicizing that, proclaiming that, preaching that, and bringing the unjust, the ungodly, the sinner to faith in Christ for salvation, for transformation of life. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 38. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Here we are assured now. The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. That's our calling. That's our ministry. That's what we are to do. We will do it in Jesus' name. We have seen Paul the Apostle, Paul the Preacher. We have seen Paul the Apostle, Paul the one that proclaimed the gospel. And now the Lord has given us that same calling. Has given us that same commission. And here is what he's telling us in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. By the grace of God, you will do it. I will do it. We will do it. And it will bear fruit in Jesus' name. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Out of season. There are times it will be convenient. There are times it will not be convenient. But do it all the same. Reprove, rebuke, exhort 
without long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and shall turn away their ears from hearing the truth, hearing the gospel, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Will you watch? I said, will you watch? Endure afflictions. Will you endure affliction? Do the work of an evangelist. Will you do the work? Make full proof of thy ministry. The Lord is calling us. Like he called Paul the apostle. Paul had done his own part of the work. It's not here in this generation. It's not your turn. It's not my turn. It's not for us to arise and to endure and to watch and to proclaim the gospel and to make full proof of our ministry. That same God that helped Paul, that same God that sustained him, that same God that gave him abundant grace, sufficient grace, is still alive and he has promised us his promise will not be in vain in our lives in Jesus' name. He helped him, he will help us. Let's not go to the throne of grace that we may obtain help. We need help this day. We need help for the ministry. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord. He has grace abundant, grace sufficient, grace enough for the calling he has given us and grace abundant for the ministry he has brought us into. Let's uh, pray that like Paul the Apostle, we will be all he wants us to be, all he has ordained that we're going to be. As for grace, he will give you grace. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.